But before we open God's word for the afternoon service, we may bow ourselves and our hearts and our heads together. Our Heavenly Father, again, we count it such a blessing and a privilege to still have the freedom in this country to worship Thee in spirit and in truth. And Lord, as we open Thy eternal word and Thy holy word, we simply pray, Lord, that You would bless the reading of Thy holy word, bless the meditation thereon, and Lord, uh, mindful of what John the Baptist said when his disciples came to him and asked questions of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, he simply said, he must increase and I must decrease. And Lord, I imagine that every single teacher of thy word in Sunday school Bible class, even the preachers at the pulpit, think the same, Lord, that we would step aside and that thy spirit would be our teacher and our guide and our comforter even this very day, this very hour, maybe even this very minute, because Lord, you know what we need. Help this servant to step aside and let thy spirit speak to himself, to the church and to the body of believers that are before us and listening. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> this year at Labor Day Retreat, our theme was taken from John chapter 17, verse 17, uh, one of my favorite verses because one of my favorite topics to think upon, meditate upon, even speak upon is truth, eternal truth, not just everyday truth. And that theme in John 17, 17 is part of Jesus' prayer there when he's praying for his disciples and saying, Lord, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so with the help of the Lord and, and kind of staying with that theme, I'd like us to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. <coughs> For our afternoon meditation. And I think with the Spirit's help, I, I'm not going to read the entire chapter here. Uh, we'll see where the Spirit leads, but probably at least the first six or seven verses here. Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Here is the recorded scripture here in this gospel. It says, Take heed, and these are Jesus' words, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when you doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which is and thy father which seeth in secret, himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I, I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which, is, which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. And I'd like to stop there at verse 8 of chapter 6 in Matthew. <clears throat> so being based on John 17, 17, the, the ultimate theme or the topic for our weekend last weekend was sanctification. And we talked about what sanctification means. Um, it can mean, and typically means, being set apart. And I like to think of it not being merely, uh, it's, it's not a setting aside, but it's being set apart for a particular purpose. And when you think about it that way, and you start thinking about the nuances of being set apart, you have to be set apart from something to something else, from where you are right now to some other location, to some other destination, to some other dedication. That's a being set apart. Now, spiritual sanctification is a little bit more than just being set apart. 
it's being set apart for a purpose. And it's more than just being set apart for a purpose. That purpose has to be sacred and holy if we're talking about the sanctification that Jesus spoke of in the 17th chapter, 17th verse. And it's that topic that I'd like to, to talk about today. So being set apart for to a special place with a special purpose, a holy purpose even, that's kind of the meaning or the the definition of sanctification. And it's, it's very important to understand that we can be sanctified by other means that doesn't lead us to God. And we'll go through a couple of examples of that. For the weekend, last weekend, I kind of did a brief census of the scripture in terms of how we can be sanctified. And there are many elements to the means for sanctification. And just if you want to read um, some of these, I wrote some of these down. These are not all the verses that speak to how we are sanctified and by whom or by what. Um, there are other verses, but these kind of give you a picture of what sanctification Jesus was talking about. First of all, John 17, 17, sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. There are a lot of synonyms for word, capital W, right? We can talk about the truth, thy word is truth, is what Jesus said. The sword of the spirit is truth, etc. Jesus is truth, scripture says. But that truth, I want to pay special attention to. That truth as it comes by God's eternal holy word in particular is the truth that we want to uh, really emphasize for this afternoon. Well, that's one way. So, Lord, and by the way, the implicit ask there, or request by Jesus is, Lord, that is speaking to God the Father, sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. So, implicit in that verse is also that God does sanctify. And we also read that um, in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, that God sanctifies us. Well, that's probably no surprise there. So God's word, his words, as recorded in Holy Scripture, is truth, and that sanctifies us. Jesus himself sanctified himself. You can read that in John 17, 19, just a few verses later. God sanctified Jesus Christ. You can read that in John 10, 36. I already mentioned that God does sanctify us. There's many verses there that um, either explicitly or implicitly let us know that we are sanctified by God. Faith, not blind faith, but faith in Jesus Christ sanctifies us, and we can find that in Acts 26, 18. The Holy Ghost sanctifies us, Romans 15, 16. The blood of Jesus Christ sanctifies us, Hebrews 9, 13. If you take a look at everything I just mentioned there, they really point to the Holy Trinity. God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the mind of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. All these things point to the Trinity as the sanctifier, the true sanctifier, right? And where it even says, hey, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us and sanctifies us, as it says in Hebrews. The faith that we have, it has to be the faith in the Trinity, faith in God's Son, Jesus Christ, that sanctifies. Why is it important to be sanctified? We can even ask that question. I think we probably all know the answer to that. But I want you to think about, well, I was thinking about some important questions about sanctification. For example, if we know that we are set apart, it, it's really a calling from God to be set apart with that holy, sacred, special purpose. We're embarking on a special path for a special purpose. That's sanctification. And then these questions came to mind, and that kind of points me to an important attribute of the Trinity that without which it, we can get very confused about sanctification. Uh, so for example, some questions come to mind. How do I know if what I'm being called to, in fact, how do I even know that the caller, how do I know that I can trust the one who calls, the one who calls me toward this purpose? How can I trust that? 
How do I stake my life on the caller and what he's calling me to do? That's a question I asked myself this past weekend. Another question, how can I be certain about the path that the caller has laid out for me? Remember, sanctification, being called out, being set apart. There's a special path that I need to follow for a special purpose. When Abraham was called, God didn't exactly lay out the path for him. He just said, get up from the land that you are in right now, and I'll show you a place. I want you to start this journey. And we know that Abraham, by faith, started that journey, not really knowing exactly where he was going. But as he went, the Lord incrementally showed him the way. But how can I know that even the start of that path is true? Is, how can I trust the caller and what he's asking me to do? How I can be certain where even the destination where that path leads without some understanding of truth? Two other questions. How do we know that the purpose that I'm being called to is legitimate? How do I know that the purpose that God is calling us to, specifically God now, specifically the gospel message, specifically what Jesus is asking to, us to do, how do I know that that's legitimate without truth as a foundation? And this last one actually relates to what Brother Joe was speaking about this morning in terms of being honest to ourselves. Well, how can we be honest with ourselves without knowing something about what is actual truth out there? How do I know when Jesus said, worship me in spirit and in truth, or worship God in spirit and truth, what that's all about? And so this last question is really important to me. I'll, I'll actually label this sermonette and we'll talk about um, being true to the truth. That's what I'd like a title to be for this afternoon's sermon. How can I know that I'm being true to the truth? Jeremiah 17, 9, where the prophet records that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And it's true that I see my heart where I try to hide some things and maybe I don't even know that there's some black dark parts in my heart because I'm deceiving myself or the, the deceiver of this world is helping me to block that out. How can I be truly unbiased with what I know in my heart? That's what I'd like to talk about. You see, I can believe in Jesus Christ. I can believe in God. I can believe in his Holy Ghost. I can have faith even. I can believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. But if I don't have truth backing me up, then I can be sanctified. Maybe I believe in the Trinity, but I can be sanctified by other means. And I can deceive myself into thinking I am doing, I am being set apart for a noble pursuit when in fact Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit and God the Father are not in it at all. And here are a couple examples. In fact, Jesus called them out. It's one of the reasons I read from Matthew 6. Giving alms is a very noble thing. It can give glory to God. Praying is what, part of what we're all about as God's children. Those are very noble things to do, but with the wrong ulterior motive, with the wrong motivation and wrong desire, we have our receipt. That's another way to, to what Jesus was saying. You know, if, don't be like those that pray in the corners and are praying with vain, vain repetition so that you can maximize your time on the corner. For what reason? Well, you can be seen of men. You, you, you have that praise of God. That's your receipt is what, Matt, uh, what Jesus was saying. When you pray like that, you'll get your receipt. You'll get your reward. That receipt, will you'll look at it and say, that, that the praise of men. Well, that's not going to last for eternity. Same way with giving alms. You know, for whose glory is that? Is it for my glory to make myself look good? Or is it to glorify God? If it's to get praise from men or 
make myself feel good, my receipt, that's going to burn up at the end of this age. I have my receipt. I have that reward. It's not going to last. It's not going to amount to anything. Only what's done for Christ will last. Alms, prayers, um, the cookie jar. <laughs> it's such a short anecdote. Um, and Joe mentioned that uh, briefly in this morning, but the story is about a little boy who broke a cookie jar, and for his mom's birthday, he broke his piggy bank, and he went to the general store, and he thought it would be a great idea to replace the cookie jar, and that would be mommy's birthday present. And he goes to the proprietor of the general store, and he asks the owner, it's like, I'd like to see your cookie jars. And the owner had a dozen of them, at least. And he was so patient with that little boy, the, the boy wanted to see them, and the owner brought down to the counter one by one, the cookie jar number one, and the boy looks at it and he's looking at it very intently and lifting the lid and even reaching inside. And it's like, no, he's not quite pleased with that one. Can I see another? And the owner brings another one down to the counter and the boy does the same thing, looks at it very intently, very carefully, lifts up the lid, reaches inside, as if he's trying it out, if you will. He's not satisfied with that either one. The owner finally brings the last one out, and the same thing, the boy looks at it, lifts the cover very carefully. Do you have any more? And the proprietor's like, I'm sorry, that's the last one. What, what's bothering you, son? Why don't you like any of these? And the little boy exclaims, like, can't you, don't you just have one that, where the lid is really quiet when you take off the lid? What a great idea to have a birthday present for mommy. But there was an ulterior motive there for the little boy who didn't want to get caught again, who didn't want to make the cookie jar to, to make noise when he reached in when he shouldn't have. I'm reminded also another true story about a reporter who wanted to go to the forefront. Uh, this reporter was always going to the forefront of dangerous events in the world and he convinced the editor that he needed to go to uh, the Bahamas because there was a very violent hurricane coming in headed straight for Florida mainland. And so he was given the reprieve to do that, finding out, knowing beforehand, that the hurricane was set to veer out to the open sea. And so he spent three nice days in the Bahamas. Ulterior motive. And that's the question I keep asking myself, loved ones, is how can I be true to the truth? Because I might be giving alms, I might be going to visit those in prison, I might be giving water and drink and food to the helpless and to the hungry, but I still remember when Jesus says later on in Matthew, it's like, Lord, didn't I do all these things in your name? And he would say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who have done iniquity. These are noble things, but with the wrong interior, ulterior motive, they don't give me salvation. They don't give me eternal rest. So how can I be true to the truth? That's where the word of God comes in. You know, I'm, I, we just got through a month of Olympics. Did you, if you think about it, those athletes, every single one of those athletes were sanctified in the sense that they were set apart. They were called to be set apart, to be disciplined enough to have the proper diet, some of them for at least four years, if not more, to have a specific exercise and regimen so that they could be set aside for a special purpose. What is that purpose? Well, you tell me. For most of them, it would be to honor their country or maybe to show the world that they are the fastest, strongest, best somehow. Very few, I would imagine, have gone to the Olympics for their sport to give glory to God. And those we do see sometimes that they raise their hand to give glory for their strength, their muscles, their speed, whatever it might be. But that's the minority loved ones. But think about it. Athletes are sanctified for a special purpose, on a special path. 
But that doesn't give them closer to God, typically. It doesn't get them closer to eternal rest. Hebrews 4.12. This is the thing that I like about the word of God. The word synonymous with truth. What did Jesus say? I'm, I have to go away. Talking to his disciples on the, those last days, that last night, I have to go away. It's expedient, for, it's necessary for you that I go away because if I don't, the comforter doesn't come. But when he comes, he will say what needs to be said. He will say only what he hears and he will guide you into all truth, all truth, the complete truth. And so when I think of Hebrews 4.12, which says, the word of God is quick, Alive that it is, right? The word is quick. When we, we, when we hear that word quick in, in scripture, that's alive, living. The word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Do you get all the words there that mean cut? Cut. Sharp two-edged sword dividing, piercing, discerning. All those words, all of them, have at its root the meaning of cut, like cut in two. Setting apart one side, setting apart another side. Without the word of truth, without the sword of the Spirit, without the word of God, the words of the Trinity, mainly through Christ because he came to earth, In Revelation, we read about the tongue being the sword of the Spirit coming out of Jesus' mouth. Without that kind of truth, how would I know if I'm deceiving myself? That verse, I, I guess I never thought of it that way, but it talks about the Word of God, but it's really talking about Jesus Christ and His Word, which we have, at least in part, through the Holy Scriptures. I love that verse in Hebrews 4.12 because it tells me that, you know what, if I'm founded, if I'm anchored on this word as a foundation of truth, then I will know. I will know. The Spirit will let me know that, you know what, you're giving alms, but it might be for the wrong reason. I'm doing this noble pursuit for the Lord, but it might be for an ulterior motive. That's part of the responsibility of the Holy Spirit. And so the most important attribute of the Trinity and that the Trinity sanctifies us. We read that God sanctifies, Jesus sanctifies, Jesus sanctified himself, God sanctified Jesus. It's the blood of Christ, it's a faith in Christ, it's the Holy Spirit. That Trinity, the Holy Trinity, maybe the one uh, uh, most important attribute, one of the most important attributes of the Trinity is that truth whereby we know that I can be true to the truth. Because I can deceive myself that I'm following Jesus and I may not be, I may not, I might have an ulterior motive. How do I know if I'm on the right path, if I'm doing the right things and getting closer to God and his heavenly kingdom? Hebrews 4.12. In 1 John, I won't turn there, but we read from this so often, and it is also, again, one of my favorite portions of scripture. Maybe I should turn to it. In 1 John chapter five, I love those verses because it also talks about truth in the sense that 1 John chapter five, beginning with, maybe at the beginning with verse six, it says, this is he that came by water and blood. So we're talking about physical presence here, talking about Jesus Christ, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. And get these verses, if we haven't mentioned this before, this is really, really important. 
He's going to talk about three things that bear witness to the truth in heaven and three things that bear witness to the truth in earth. And what are those three entities? In verse 7, he says, There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, capital W, meaning Christ, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Trinity, Holy Trinity. That Holy Trinity as separate entities bear witness to the truth in heaven. Why is that important? Because the next verse says, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. What's the common entity there in those two verses? It's the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, who is, was, is in heaven, and who is, was, witness the things that here are here on earth. The word of God, the spirit of God, the words of Jesus Christ coming from the Trinity, his mind we have through the Holy Spirit, it is that spirit that reveals the truth. That's how we know, loved ones, that when God calls us to him through faith in Christ Jesus, that is the thing to do. When he says we need to worship God in spirit and in truth, we have to do it through the word of God and through the unction of the Holy Spirit or the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's how we know that the calling is true. That's how we know that heaven exists and a hell. That's how we know that God is merciful and forgiving. That's how we know that God will also be a judge and clear when he judges. And there's no escaping that if we're on the wrong end of that cut. When the Holy Spirit, when the word of God, when the tongue and the words of Jesus Christ divide at the end of this age. It is by the word of God, the sword of the spirit, by the words of Christ, that we know what complete truth is and that we know if we are deceiving even our very souls. Because the Holy Spirit, loved ones, will convict us. Like we have so many examples in scripture, Old Testament and New. So I just wanted to relate that to you as I was thinking about the idea of sanctification you know, we can be sanctified by many things. And I'm even thinking of 9-11 where some pilots that hijacked their planes, they thought that they were set apart for a special purpose, and they were. But we know what happened when those towers fell. We know how many lives were lost. We know what the ulterior motive was of the organization behind those gentlemen who were called by that organization to do these evil things. How are we sanctified? How do we know that special purpose? How do we know that path? How do we know the honesty and integrity of the caller and what he's calling us to do? It's by this book, eternal word, holy scripture only, only. And if we're falling away from it, if we're not feasting on it, if we're not meditating on it, we are in danger of fearing and being sanctified by something else. May God bless his word to our hearts. And we'll continue with singing.